Thank you. And next, uh, remotely, we're, we have um, Marnie Falk from the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Can someone tell her to hold? Hey, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Maybe somebody nod on the panel. I can see you. <laughs> Great. Hi, good morning, Sue. Okay, wonderful. Well, it's an honor and a privilege to be with you, um, even remotely. Um, and you can see my screen, hopefully. Maybe nod again. Yes. Great. Okay. Well, I'll, I'm here to talk with you this morning about nutrition and its therapeutic role in mitochondrial disease. These are my disclosures. Um, I work closely with the United Mitochondrial Disease Foundation and multiple companies uh, to develop new therapies and understanding in mitochondrial disease. And uh, we have three active clinical trials listed at the bottom um, in mitochondrial disease now, of which I'm a site PI. So I think it's always helpful when we think about mitochondria to start at the beginning. Mitochondria are subcellular cytoplasmic organelles that arose about two billion years ago from an ancient symbiont ancestor, a purple sulfur cyanobacteria that could handle oxygen. It's been my experience that no matter what audience you speak with, um, everybody knows the major function of the mitochondria, which is to be the powerhouse of the cell. And while energy production is indeed um, remarkably important, it's also um, essential that we understand mitochondria are the hub of many other uh, essential activities, including calcium homeostasis, the initiation of programmed cell death. They're the major location of free radical generation, as well as scavenging. They have essential steps in steroid biosynthesis. And if metabolism is an orchestra, the mitochondria are the conductor. Really, their major uh, role um, is to take nearly every metabolic pathway um, and, nutrient, and, and result in the end um, oxidation of nutrients to permit cell growth and function. When you think about mitochondrial disease, people think about this system um, um, displayed right here. So the reason why you all ate this morning and then took a break is to keep uh, rejuvenating your reducing equivalents that come from cellular metabolism breakdown that feed the electron transport chain, which consists of four complexes um, that shuttle electrons until molecular oxygen oxidizes them and converts it to water. In the process, creating a, a positive charge, uh, leaving the mitochondrial matrix to go into the intermembrane space, leaving the inside negatively charged the intermembrane stays positively charged, essentially like a battery, and that potential difference is used to power um, complex five or ATC synthase to make energy. Energy is really a series of high phosphate bonds. And you take adenosine diphosphate, combine it with inorganic phosphate, and make adenosine triphosphate. That is the chemical form of energy, and that is the essence of life. When mitochondrial disease does not work, it can cause uh, sorry, when mitochondrial function does not work, it can cause any symptom in any organ, at any age, by any mode of inheritance. That's pretty overwhelming and kept people pretty skeptical for quite some time about what mitochondrial disease was. Many people have tried to make a biomarker for mitochondrial disease, but unfortunately there is no single biomarker. Lactic acid can be useful in some people, but it's like spinning a square into a circle hole. Um, it just doesn't work for everybody. Now we understand why there is no one single biomarker for mitochondrial disease. It would be like having a single biomarker for all disease because we know now that mitochondrial disease results in mutations across nearly 300 known genes and probably several hundred more yet to be identified. They occur in mutations um, in the DNA within the mitochondria itself, a small mitochondrial genome of which we have many copies, and nuclear DNA as well. We know of over 250 genes. There's been more than 20 genes identified a year for the last five years, um, if not longer, uh, that are newly recognized to cause mitochondrial disease. And while each individual gene cause is fairly uncommon, collectively it's the most common inborn error of metabolism, affecting at least one in 40, 300 people across all ages. This understanding has changed how we think about mitochondrial disease. We've known for decades that it's multi-organ failure. And we've known since the 50s that it's about uh, a problem due to energetic um, dysfunction, making energy as the major um, pathway I discussed. But now we recognize there's many, many different pathways that could be affected. And so this molecular um, 
classification disease um, um, has been added on to what we understood previously. This is an excellent review that just describes some of the major pathways involved in mitochondrial disease. So there is the electron transport chain uh, shown schematically here, which I mentioned to you earlier. Um, but there's also um, a lot of other pathways, one bringing nucleic acids into the mitochondria in the right form to allow mitochondrial DNA to be produced. There's making the protein, there's only 13 proteins made from the mitochondrial DNA in a very um, complex um, and energy demanding uh, process. There's protein quality control, um, energy um, um, ATP being moved outside of the mitochondria, mitochondria fizzing and fusing together, among others. We've created an international resource that describes the clinical features, the genetic uh, causes and the variants within them of these different mitochondrial diseases, something called the Mitochondrial Disease Sequence Data Resource that is um, contributed to and shared internationally because the ability to recognize any one mitochondrial disease is really um, beyond um, classical phenotype, genotype recognition. Um, there's many different causes um, of, of any one phenotype. These are the major clinical features of mitochondrial disease. It's really any organ can be involved. Most patients have some form of neurologic and or um, muscle involvement, and it could be any one of the multiple nervous systems in a person's body, the central nervous system, the peripheral nervous system, the autonomic nervous system, as well as um, the gastrointestinal nervous system. And in addition to the neurologic problems that can happen at any age, ranging from headaches and balance problems to Parkinson's or developmental regression, um, eye problems are uh, very common, so drooping eyelids, eye muscle movement problems, retinal and optic nerve problems. There can certainly be heart problems that either um, are the sole feature or um, a progressive problem over time, as well as liver problems, kidney problems, both glomerular and renal tubular, a host of endocrine problems, um, including diabetes and pancreatic problems, as well as um, hypothalamic issues, um, a, a range of gastrointestinal problems, fertility problems, and bone problems. When we asked people um, with mitochondrial disease what symptoms do they have, we asked um, up to 35 different medical problems. On average, whether they were a child or an adult, patients with mitochondrial disease have 16 major medical problems. The top five experienced by most mitochondrial disease patients are muscle weakness, chronic fatigue, exercise intolerance, gastrointestinal problems, and balance problems, but many other problems happen, including eye problems, gaining weight, losing weight, each in about half, lipid disorders, seizures, liver, kidney disease, stroke, and so on. So it's really a very um, morbid um, disease. Unfortunately, at this time, there are no proven effective therapies or cures for mitochondrial disease. Why not? I think it'll be obvious, uh, just reflecting, <coughs> because there's so many rare disorders, and they're highly heterogeneous, this was a barrier to properly you know, investigating and grouping disease. Exercise has been shown for about a decade to have therapeutic value. However, we lack clarity on the optimal diet, and I'll be uh, sharing this um, more with you um, momentarily. There is a long history of so-called mitochondrial cocktails, which are one-size-fits-all, but very variably used, empirically uh, given supplements, um, vitamins and nutrients, um, and cofactors, that in theory target mitochondrial enzymes and cellular stress. Some of the major categories in which these cofactors um, and supplemental um, recommendations fall are listed below. Um, agents uh, that uh, increase the free coenzyme Q pool are cofactors uh, for mitochondrial enzymes such as thiamine or riboflavin, different metabolite therapies, I'll be talking more about arginine, with folinic acid, it's fairly well documented that a central folate deficiency occurs when the electron transport chain function is abnormal. Creatine, which is um, a way to store energy in the muscle uh, for ready use, as well as um, other newer therapies like a, an enzyme activator such as dichloroacetate, for which there's a trial that's just starting that's been taking five years uh, to plan, if not more, from the FDA. Um, that activates pyruvate dehydrogenase enzymes and for individuals with the mito disease called pyruvate dehydrogenase deficiency. There's also a range of antioxidants ranging from vitamin C or E to lipoic acid, CoQ, and others. So what about amino acid therapies? For about the last decade, the focus has been on arginine and now maybe citrulline. These are nitric oxide donors that target microvascular endothelial ischemia that occurs in metabolic strokes. 
These are not classic vascular strokes, um, such as embolic strokes that might occur in an older person with age. These are high energy demand areas of the brain that with stressors, um, the cells become sick and die and there's neurologic problems. But we believe that there's some reversibility to it because when some patients with mitochondrial disease, such as a common mitochondrial DNA uh, syndrome called MILAS or mitochondrial encephalopathy, lactic acid and stroke-like episodes, um, develop these strokes, um, they have been shown to be mitigated uh, with intravenous arginine. So there has been expert panel consensus to consider its use, and overall they're well tolerated when administrated, administered at the proper doses, monitoring for low blood pressure and, and low blood sugar, which are, uh, can occur but are not common or typically serious um, when, when monitored for. There's also a recent um, work um, from our group and others that these metabolic strokes in diverse mitochondrial diseases, not just the mitochondrial DNA ones, um, might um, have use. And so in our uh, retrospective analysis of our own clinical practice at our center, there was more than a 50% clinical response when children showed up with hemiplegic strokes, um, whereas otherwise there's no treatments for these diseases. And really, uh, these agents are now commonly used as prophylaxis for metabolic stroke occurrence in a diverse range of uh, mitochondrial diseases from MELAS to pediatric Lee syndrome. And there's a comparative study underway, um, I believe, which the IND um, has been successfully filed by Dr. Cornell Nostalia to compare arginine versus citrulline. We have the most experience with arginine, but citrulline seems to have even improved ability um, to uh, improve nitric oxide flux. So what about other aspects of nutrition and mitochondrial disease? There's really very limited guidance. The, the guidance that has existed has suggested that energy, protein, and micronutrient intake should be evaluated. Um, there should be assessment for relative undernutrition, considering issues like altered energy expenditure, abnormal intake and absorption. Many patients, not all, but many require gastrostomy tube or enteral, I'm sorry, parenteral nutrition. And very commonly, there's swallowing dysfunction, abnormal gut motility, overgrowth, behavioral feeding issues, and reflux uh, that need to be optimized um, to um, improve nutrition. It's also um, known that there could be essential micronutrient deficiencies as listed here from B12 to vitamin D, which are very common to folate, zinc, et cetera. And my multivitamin supplements are safe and thought uh, to alleviate some of these potential deficiencies with some thought, um, although it's not widely implemented necessarily, to include lutein um, if there is um, ophthalmologic involvement of the optic nerve or retina. Overall, there's fairly common sense recommendations. Um, avoiding fasting and encouraging frequent small meals are widely encouraged. And fluid intake is recommended to be increased whenever um, there is heat or metabolic stress. So fairly limited um, and, and practical guidelines. In terms of what the diet should involve, there is no clear macronutrient profile. There is no scientific data to support specific macronutrient profiles, such as the ratio of protein, carbs, or fat. However, um, there has been a lot of discussion. So the ketogenic diet is a very controversial um, um, entity in mitochondrial disease. The thought is, is that by increasing ketones and succinate, um, and activating the starvation response, you activate mitochondrial biogenesis as well as um, enhanced glutathione metabolism. There's been a lot of studies in mice with very controversial results. In a mouse model um, of C10 or F2, so um, an inability to replicate mitochondrial DNA, and they get mitochondrial myopathy, the ketogenic diet um, was beneficial in slowing myopathy progression. The high-fat diet also um, slowed neurologic progression in a complex one deficient genetic disease model, but it exacerbated disease in two other mitochondrial disease models, um, the MTRF2 and the MPV17, the latter which gets the kidney disease. The further complicating factor is that ketogenic diet is simply not tolerated in mitochondrial disease patients. Many patients often have high blood triglycerides, probably as part of the disease, and they have a reduced impairment in many cases to burn fat. They have reduced fatty acid oxidation capacity and reduced PPAR signaling activity, factors that make the ketogenic diet inherently uh, difficult. There's also concerns about long-term health risks of the ketogenic diet, and if there is any one place where it's used, people uh, sometimes consider it for refractory epilepsy. The modified Atkins diet, or a very high-fat, uh, low-carb diet, um, has been tried based upon preliminary data that is useful in the mouse. So in the same 
patients with the mouse model um, suggested, <coughs> the ones that get difficulties replicating their mitochondrial DNA. There was a report two years ago uh, from Finland of a modified Atkins diet um, that had been successful in the mouse being tried in human patients with mitochondrial DNA deletions that lead to myopathy. Three of these um, individuals have the same single nuclear gene disorder um, that predisposed uh, the, the twinkle gene to these deletions, and two others have sporadic mutations or deletions in their mitochondria and their muscle. All of these patients, um, five of them in 10 match controls, were switched from a normal diet to a planned trial of four weeks on a modified Atkins diet. Their normal diet um, is shown here with a carb percentage of 41 to 48 percent, 14 to 20 percent protein, and 27 to 38 percent fat. They were induced over a few weeks, for, um, or they were tried to switch over to a low-carb diet by increasing protein and fat, and they all achieved low carb, um, or a carb percentage of three to nine percent. The healthy controls had no problem completing the four-week trial with no adverse effects seen. However, all five mitochondrial myopathy patients stopped the diet after four days to 11 days, and they all had the exact same progression of severe muscle pain and burning from their legs to their back to their arms to their neck, as well as headaches and increased tiredness. This corresponded to muscle, bi muscle biopsy findings of necrosis, increased creatine kinase activity, increased lactate with exercise, and the thought was because their muscle fibers can't burn oxygen to make energy, they require glycolysis, and so by lowering the sugar so uh, profoundly in their diet, um, it was not tolerated um, in their muscles that could not burn sugar. Um, I'm sorry, that could not burn fat. They were really very highly glycolytic. So what about at the reverse, using a high carbohydrate diet? The supporting evidence is that the glycolytic rate is increased in mitochondrial disease. It's very clear in many people that crave carbohydrates um, and that they really utilize their glycolysis as is very clear in many model animals. When patients present with a stressor, such as a fever and infection, they're often given glucose-containing fluids with or without insulin, but the idea is to prevent catabolism, a very uh, standard practice in, in born areas of metabolism used in this population. The crowd craving that I mentioned often starts with minutes of awakening, and they, they can't think clearly, they'll report, um, or feel well until after they eat. Some of them even uh, take heart cornstarch overnight and report feeling better in the morning. The, there's a lot of um, cellular dysfunction um, in, in cells and models that um, glucose actually treats. So glucose itself or sugar could be a, a therapy in this disease, but it might be the type of carbohydrate. So whereas um, high glycemic carbs um, might not um, improve um, function, there's been a study that's um, in preparation for publication now showing that low glycemic carbs may indeed improve health outcomes and cognition. There have been concerns about glucose infusions precipitating a metabolic crisis since there isn't altered NADH to NAD balance, so it might be a, a matter of um, you know, how, it's, how it's done. There's, in a Drosophila model um, that had a mitochondrial translation defect, their growth was lower in high glucose, so again, it might be the level of glucose that you use. And it's also concerning that some patients do have glucose dysregulation. So diabetes mellitus um, is common in some mitochondrial disease patients, more often in adults than in kids, around a 25% frequency um, in the, a recent publication we've done of the North American Mitochondrial Disease Consortium database, and hypo, whereas it's only 2% in kids, forgive me, and hypoglycemia is also common in some patients. So as glucose might be a therapy, there's a lot more that needed uh, to be understood about how to utilize it. In terms of clinical trials for mitochondrial disease, there is no universal trial design, outcome measure, or biomarker. There was a very helpful critical path innovation meeting held in, um, at the request of the Food and Drug Administration with our community in 2015, uh, where they provided guidance. There are now multiple trials um, for the last five years ago that have uh, been started more robustly um, following um, th these guidance and, and the increased understanding in the community of how important they are. Most of them have been on antioxidants without um, necessarily good results. The first trial was coenzyme Q. This trial never filled. It was a multi-site trial, but patients didn't want to participate because they could get the, the coenzyme Q themselves at the pharmacy um, and didn't need to enter a trial where they may not even receive it. So um, that was one lesson learned. Adebanone has been approved in Europe 
without meeting its primary endpoint. And so now there's a, a trial ongoing uh, for uh, its conditional approval. There have been other antioxidants. Uh, one sudden pediatric Lee syndrome with metabolic stroke that failed its primary outcome with multiple other studies ongoing. And another one um, that was discontinued also in pediatric Lee syndrome. There are three active clinical trials. Um, we have them all at our site and they're all multi-site uh, trials. Um, one is um, the stealth biotherapeutics compound, um, elamipratide for myopathy, with other trials in exercise intolerance and Lieber's optic neuropathy. Another trial, this is now entering phase three, another trial that's an NRF2 agonist um, in myopathy, and then the FDA approved dichloroacetate trial um, that's now just getting underway. So what about novel treatment strategies? Uh, this um, is from a, a lovely review from 2012 in the New England Journal of Medicine saying that when you have a mitochondrial disease, it's primary if there's a genetic cause for it, it's secondary if it's sort of another problem in, a, in, a, in another disease state. But regardless, when you have a mitochondrial problem, um, there are genetic strategies you might consider to fix it, small molecule um, approaches, metabolic uh, manipulation, and diet and exercise to really treat the secondary cell consequences of the disease. When I think about how a mitochondrial disease uh, therapy might unfold, I think of the mitochondrial respiratory chain as a black box making certain products. Those products are free radicals, energy in the form of ATP, nucleic acids, and nicotinamide adenine, adenine dinucleotides. All of these have therapies um, that we could study. Antioxidants, glucose, uridine, and nicotinic acid. And if you were to give any one of these um, compounds or, or therapeutic um, approaches, you wouldn't necessarily be treating the others. So you might well need a combinatorial approach. Historically, when there's mitochondrial dysfunction, again, whether it's primary or secondary, and there's many drugs and chemicals in the environment that can impair mitochondrial function as well as other disease states, most people, again, have done what I've shown you, try to give empiric therapy to boost mitochondrial function. But what we've learned is that the whole cell is responding when there's mitochondrial dysfunction and re adapting and regulating itself. And so there's transcriptional and post-transcriptional changes, as well as changes throughout the signaling network that responds to nutrition, what we could call the nutrient sensing signaling network, where some key nodes are mTOR, amkinase, sirtuins, PPAR, and FOXO. And so we um, and others have been looking at therapies that don't target the mitochondrial function proximately, but the downstream effect. This is a, a schematic that shows that approach where the mitochondria simply isn't working, and so it's activating certain key signaling uh, networks and biological processes, such as mitophagy and the mTOR process, where in the end result, you're getting too much translation, too much lysosomal degradation of mitochondria, and too much stress. So are there therapies, nutritional or drugs, that can treat these uh, nutrient sensing signaling network changes. One key example um, is an NAD donor, which is uh, just niacin or vitamin B3. There's many formulations of it. And in our hands and others, um, it's um, useful to both normalize the signaling network activity. So here you can see a child cells uh, with um, complex one deficiency that's genetically based. And you can see that her S6 um, phosphorylation levels are much higher than in the controls. Her AM kinase levels are also higher. That's classic in mitochondrial disease. And when we give her one or ten microns uh, uh, niacin, um, you can see that these other signaling pathways normalize. Um, her NADH levels in her cells and her NAD levels are low, with the ratio being high, and all of this is corrected on the niacin therapy. The total cellular oxfos consumption capacity is also improved. And it's not because we're improving complex one function, it's simply probably because we're making more mitochondria. We've now, in a C. elegans model of mitochondrial disease, it's the parallel of the child's disease, um, have tested um, more than three dozen different molecules suggested to be useful, nutrients and supplements um, and, and classical drugs that fall into three categories, antioxidants, metabolic modifiers, um, and signaling modifiers. And what you can see is these animals are short-lived compared to healthy animals, wild-type controls. And then in each of these classes, there's some key lead therapies that really restore the short lifespan of the mutant C. elegans worm back to normal. And the, the best signaling modifiers with nicotinic acid, which is like in for bucol. Dichloroacetate works very well in this uh, complex one disease model, as did glucose. 
and the antioxidants, nicotinic, I'm sorry, and acetyl 15 and vitamin E uh, were very effective. So each of these um, molecules alone um, has beneficial effects. Um, and uh, we validated this in a, in a vertebrate model, zebrafish, where you can see this is a normal brain of a zebrafish larvae on day seven after fertilization. Here's the animal after exposed to an acute mityl toxin, rotenone, that inhibits complex one. And you can see that if an antioxidant is present, in this case, n cysteine when they see the stressor, they don't lose their brain function. Or the analogy would be they don't have the stroke. And this n cysteine works half the time. Vitamin E works 100% of the time. And so in this setting, these are not simply antioxidant um, dietary supplements. These would be considered, in my mind, a drug. And so we've really studied many different ones um, now um, in model animals, uh, the complex one disease model and others. And this is the order of um, efficacy that we see with different antioxidants, whereas some have no effect. And the effects are very much concentration dependent and very unique um, to each molecule, where often the higher you go, you lose the effect. Um, so there's a lot of pharmacology related to these nutrients. The metabolic modifiers um, have very variable physiologic effects. There's actually a range of therapies from glucose to thiamine to riboflavin, carnitine and dichloroacetate that rescue um, the integrated endpoint of short lifespan in these animals. Some of these drugs surprisingly actually increase <coughs> the ability uh, to make more mitochondria, and some of them give unexpected effects like folinic acid actually works as a scavenger for ROS in our model. So we've started to combine some of these therapies to evaluate the synergy in the disease state. And um, we have a work now uh, being submitted showing that glucose, N-acetylcysteine, and NAD therapies together substantially rescue survival and function and health in these models. There might well be sense uh, to thinking about combinatorial treatments um, to treat the different deficiencies that are occurring in human molecules in this disease state, but not all, all combinations are equally effective. This is a very important um, summary that came out last year by Dr. Prokish's group, which simply shows that now that we have many different genetic causes of mitochondrial disease, we're getting many different therapies. And you'll notice a lot of these are classical vitamins, the riboflavin, thiamine, biotin, um, coenzyme Q, copper histidine, uh, uh, dietary modifications like restricting valine. So if you do know the exact genetic cause underlying uh, the mitochondrial disease as well as the pathway involved, um, there's often very good treatments now for those types of diseases. And this is just a list um, from a few months ago and, and it's continually growing. What our group and others do is we take model animals and cells from patients with mitochondrial disease. We model nutritional variation, drugs, genetic therapies on different out points that are similar to what the FDA would want, the so survival, function, feeling, but also better understanding biomarkers and um, metabolism. And our uh, approach is to also, what was mentioned earlier, uh, aim for precision medicine or N of one individualized trials where once we know the type of disease that a child might have and whatever the therapeutic seed is from the preclinical modeling to figure out what their patient important outcome is, um, working with the family, whether it's uh, a quantitative um, motor assessment or an overall developmental scale or headache or stroke frequency um, to figure out if that therapy actually works in that patient. So in conclusion, some classical therapies do have objective therapeutic value in mitochondrial disease. I believe their true value is drugs and not dietary supplements, whether this is a regulatory argument or otherwise, um, they are absolutely restoring uh, the health state in, in genetically programmed diseases. And there may well be synergy if the proper combinations could be identified um, with unique mechanisms treating different aspects of what's wrong in the disease. It's probably ideal to model therapies in different mitochondrial disease subtypes before giving them empirically or in clinical trials. Sometimes we have unexpected um, adverse effects um, in certain subgroups, and it would be ideal to avoid these. It is challenging to identify the optimal nutrition, drug concentrations, and combinations for different mitochondrial disease subtypes, but it's increasingly possible. And um, from our work and others, it seems a promising mitochondrial disease diet might be low glycemic, high carb, as opposed to high fat. And then um, it's going to become essential to evaluate the effects of the dietary um, and vitamin um, and therapies uh, that we give to figure out which aspects of these complex multisystemic diseases respond. Patients want their energy levels better, their balance better, their gastrointestinal function better, but of course, 
you know, can we reverse or prevent kidney disease? Can we reverse or prevent vision loss, hearing loss, et cetera? And so a lot of these probably have value, just like good nutrition, in adding resiliency to patients with a disease state. So in some cases, for example, like a stroke or acute vision loss, what can be done to treat that? Versus what can you give somebody with a known genetic predisposition? How can you modify their, their therapies to prevent them from having the onset of these problems in the first place? Very commonly when they get a stressor is when you, their problems develop. And so how do we give them resiliency so that when they see their stressors, they don't develop these decompensations in their different organ systems? Thank you.